Welcome back to our amazing World Bike Tour. After well over 7,000 kilometers of cycling, we reached the southeast of Armenia, a small country in the southern Caucasus. And this time we are aiming high. We are on our way from Gores to Megri, just shy of the Iranian border, about 150 kilometers away. With one mountain pass after another, it's literally only going up and down. Doing this at the back end of winter is not ideal, but we just couldn't stay inside any longer. We also plan to cycle at extreme altitudes a couple of months down the road, making this the perfect challenge to see how we deal with freezing temperatures and steep mountains. On top of this, while Armenia is my home country, I have never been this far in the south before. So join us as we cycle breathtaking roads, explore relics of the long gone Soviet times and even get an adorable travel companion along the way. Oh my god, can we even pass there? There's an old airfield or something. I hope we can get through. Um, wow, is this supposed to be the road on the left? No, no, f Oh, shit. Come on. It is an unused airfield, but very close to the border with Azerbaijan, so we were not allowed to film, but of course we got a hot coffee. While this was a dead end, the soldiers pointed us in the right direction. Let's go! We had a slight hope that we could use the wings of Tartev. It's uh, an aerial tramway, apparently the longest in the world, but they are not open for the for the winter and still not open. Well, they will open in five days. Yeah, in five days. We're just a tiny little bit too early. Too early yeah. This means we have to go all the way down the valley and then up again, and it looks pretty steep. Yeah. So let's see how this goes. And testing. They're empty. Come on. Now I see the road we have to climb tomorrow. Very nice, steep, beautiful. <laughs> yeah. So we have to start down there and climb up to that top of the mountain. So we found this place. It's almost flat. And also we adopted a dog. Um, He's a stray dog and he is defending us pretty loudly. So there was a shepherd going up here and he was super scared. And we can't tell the dog to stop because it's not our dog. Um, so we're safe here. That's good. Our good friend here defended us the whole night, barking every five minutes or so. It was really loud uh, and now he wants uh, us to feed him but we don't have any more food so I'm so sorry I can give you more water look you can have more water there's still water We are at the lowest point of the street and now have a six kilometer long climb. It's fair to say it's well above 10% average, which will be a lot of fun today, right? <laughs> I'm happy. This is my happy face. <laughs> 
Once you are down in that gorge, the only way out is climbing this impressive series of switchbacks. Perfect for breakfast. Ah, take a deep breath. There's nothing better than the smell of burnt clutch and brakes in the morning. <laughs> oh, that was amazing here. Just to give you an idea how steep it really is, this truck is empty because he's going to Iran. And that's the speed he's going. Behind that mountain, he started following us all the way down, stayed with us the whole night, kept us awake, and now he followed us up this mountain. Actually, the climb wasn't too bad. When we reach Tartev at 1530 meters, the clouds are heavy and we make it to our homestay just before it starts raining through the whole afternoon and night. The sun is shining, but it's very chilly, it's very cold. We spent the night here at the local B&B and now we are going to see this famous and beautiful monastery of Tatev. Our friend is back. <laughs> oh no. Oh bro. The dog's like, hey guys, I'm back. <laughs> Yesterday we were so mean, we just went in our B&B and closed the gate and hoped that he would find new friends. We wonder how far he will follow us. The rise of the famous Tatev Monastery began in the 9th century with the construction of a new church in 848. By the early 11th century, Tatev hosted around 1,000 monks. In 1044, armed forces of the neighboring emirates destroyed the St. Gregory Church and its surrounding buildings, which were reconstructed soon after. Over the following centuries, the monastery suffered a whole series of destruction and looting during multiple invasions by Seljuk Turks, Timurids and Persians, being rebuilt every single time. This went on until the Russian Empire took control of the Southern Caucasus in the 1800s. The monastery was also badly damaged by several earthquakes and since the last one in 1931 it's missing its bell tower. Tatev is one of the best known monasteries of Armenia today, not least because of its magnificent location. If you should ever make it here, consider taking a ride with the wings of Tatev. Next, we want to reach Kapan, the biggest city of the Sunik province. Obviously, that involves more switchbacks. These nice gentlemen just invited us to a coffee. And I think they have a problem with their car. It's a pretty old one. Maybe you can help me with the model. <clears throat> we did about six kilometers in the last three hours. Whew, but we are almost at the top. Ah, <sighs> Vorotan Pass or something. And our friend is obviously still here. Day number three. Uh, those two dogs don't like our dog. So this will be interesting now. 
So we'll try to pass them without them killing our doggy, right? Bro. Okay, come, come. Come with me. Hey! We're just passing through. We're just passing through. Geh runter vom Fahrrad. Geh runter vom Fahrrad. Okay, wir müssen hier geradeaus. Wir müssen geradeaus, nicht links. Geradeaus. Geradeaus, nicht links. Wir müssen geradeaus, nicht links. I think after this little encounter with the other dogs, he will, he will follow us forever. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Now it goes downhill and will be so much faster than you. I think he will, he will come. He will reach us. So sweet. We are at the highest point today, at about 2,000 meters altitude. The landscapes here are just amazing. The clouds are huge. <laughs> Everything is rough. The roads are just up and down. We don't understand how this dog got so attached to us, but the feelings are likewise. The problem is that we will leave Armenia in a few weeks and there is no way that we would take him with us. On the last descent we lost sight of him for a couple of minutes, but he caught up with us eventually as the road started to climb again. Ah, <laughs> I had high hopes that we do not need to do this climb, but uh, looking on this road with this sign, I'll probably take the climb. This one is particularly steep. I think short and steep. Yeah, I think it's 1.5 more kilometers, but it's pretty steep. We cycle, I don't know, 100 meters, make a break. Unfortunately, I don't know what to do with the dog. I can't hit him or something. So he will just eventually not be able to keep up because now we'll outrun him for sure. I hope he's, he's not going to get hit by a car trying to chase us. Okay. Here we go. He stayed with us for three days and we will betray his loyalty the third time now. There is no way that he can keep up with us on this 22 km long, 1000 meter perfect descent. On other days we would feel pure joy, but as we are leaving our furry travel companion behind, we are a bit sad. <laughs> No, 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 no! <laughs> They all panic. 
We just entered Kaban, which is deep inside of uh, the Sunik region in the south of Armenia. I am quite glad that we made it that day, as I feel exhausted and need a rest day. These days, Kapan is still struggling to cope with the realities of the post-Karabakh war and post-Soviet era. However, there are signs of growth and development, especially in the tourism sector, as the surrounding mountains offer great hiking opportunities. With the history of being part of the Soviet Union for about 70 years, it's quite obvious that in Armenia you also run into relics of the Soviet Union time. I'm sitting here now in the Ferris wheel of the Kapan Amusement Park, which uh, have seen better times. SSSR, made in the USSR. <laughs> we are in Louis factory. Louis means light. Надо изобретать не то, что хочется, а то, что требуется производству. Мастер, покажи рабочим безопасные методы работы. Master, show the workers the safe methods of working. <laughs> And there is another one. I... Oh, what is this? So it's, let me see, it shows the different types of lights, I guess, have a look. Yeah, oh, interesting. Learn constantly and can you do it yourself? Teach the others. This is a very socialistic idea, it says, like working for the society, you work for yourself. <laughs> Strictly forbidden to smooth. In reality, however, things were quite differently during the Soviet rule. The general measure of a job well done was the fulfillment of quotas, as in reaching the production targets set by party functionaries in Moscow. Managing a factory was a delicate balancing act deliver too little and it could mean penal camp for the local functionary. On the other hand, overfulfillment was also undesirable and hardly ever achieved as increased efficiency and or quality did not directly benefit anyone. The income was fixed and higher positions often assumed through cronism or outright corruption. Thus, there was barely any incentive to perform better on a personal level. On the contrary, Overfulfillment was rather risky for the men in charge, as this led to an upward adjustment of targets. If a bad year followed, there was again a threat of, you guessed it, Gulag. There are countless more examples of how the twisted logic of the Soviet command economy combined with a ruthless, autocratic and corrupt leadership led to bad working morale and a generally laughable sense of quality. If it doesn't fall apart immediately, it's good enough. Passed down over the generations, this is still a noticeable problem in former Soviet societies like Armenia, even 35 years later.
We rested two days in Kaupan. I was a little under the weather with a sort of a cold. Now I'm much better because we stayed another day. So we are fresh. And that's good because today we have to go up all day long. It's the last pass before Megri. It's a total of 2000 meters elevation we need to go up, which we'll do not in one day. It's too much. We'll do it in two days. So let's see how far we can go today. The final ascent before the Iranian border begins in Kaphan. It is 38 kilometers all the way to the top and the landscape looks pretty rough. After a harsh winter everything is dry and barren. Coming spring and with it rainfall in a few weeks these landscapes will briefly turn green. But even now, there's a lot of life around us. Behind these massive mountains lay the Shikahoch State Reserve and the Arabic National Park, home to about 1,100 species of plants, many of them endangered. Their fauna hasn't been fully explored, but studies have already revealed rare species of animals, such as leopard, wild goat, bear, snowcock, wiper, and hedgehog, to name a few. Speaking of animals, we miss our trusty companion, although it was probably better to lose him instead of luring him even further away. The last couple of days, when I heard a dog barking outside of our guest house, I would go look for him on the street. How likely is this? Another cyclist at this time of the year, we did not expect this. And another dog. <laughs> During our lunch break, Manel from Catalonia in Spain catched up with us and we have another dog. Amazing. Oh, shit. Oh, this is insane. 10% average is insane. Oh shit. <laughs> oh. Holy moly. It's training for the bar meal. Huh? What? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Unfortunately, there was no water to be found. All the fountains were dry. <laughs> so, probably no pasta today or we find enough snow maybe, hopefully. We're at 2200 meters now, much higher than we anticipated. But the first place where we wanted to put our tents was super, super muddy. Uh, also, we didn't have water. Eventually, we did find a place for our tents. This is the highest altitude we have stayed a night yet. In a couple of months, we want to ride the iconic Pamir Highway in Tajikistan, which for most of the way is twice as high up. This was a cold night indeed, but we managed and are rewarded with this beautiful view in return. <laughs> it's after 1 pm already. <laughs> and we still don't have water. We asked a trolley <laughs> driver yesterday in the evening and he gave us some water. But again, we are out of water and we have to climb this. Make me pass. So maybe we eat some snow or something because it's just over there. Hello. Really great. Like on, on lorry drivers, you, you can always spend a lorry driver. They will always stop and help you. We see countless Iranian trucks these days. No wonder, as the M2 is the only road connecting Armenia with Iran. 
Manel got the visa, but we didn't apply for it. Due to the massive protests over the death of Masa Amini through the hands of the so-called moral police of Iran and the following brutal backslash of the government, we decided to skip Iran for now. It was a difficult decision that we had taken a couple of months ago, during the bloodiest phase, when our contacts in the country told us that it wasn't a good time. We made it! This is Megri Pass, 2,535 meters altitude. It's pretty cold. Right now we're preparing for the descent uh, because here this is brutally cold and going down with the wind will be much colder even. So we put on every clothes we have, all layers, the winter gloves. <laughs> I have, still have some more clothes. Don't stop, don't stop. So we are right at the border to Iran and they have a very very serious border fence here and then there's a river so we'll not cross well, we will cross tomorrow and we will return to Yerevan and now we're trying to find a place where we can spend the night Time to say goodbye. We had a pleasant night. Manel looks as fresh as ever because he will cross the border to Iran today and out of me will head this way and try to check out some abandoned place. So we'll see about that. We're a little bit sad that we cannot go to Iran because we don't have a visa and yeah. It was a pleasure. <laughs> all the best. Bye, all the luck. Before we hitchhike back to Yerevan and prepare for Central Asia, there was one more thing I wanted to see for a while. Another lost place from the Soviet times, not far from here. Unfortunately, on the road is a checkpoint and the soldiers are terribly sorry, but not allowed to let anyone pass who is not a local or doesn't have a special permit. Instead, they advise us to visit the grandpa living across the street. I'm fairly pissed, but remember that we wanted to go with the flow. 
Georgi, or Grandpa Jora, was born in Migri but had worked in Russia all his life. He still has wife and kids there, but over all these years his dream to come back to his hometown did not vanish. When he retired, he bought a barren patch of land overlooking the Aras river that marks Armenia's border with Iran and created this little paradise. He has a friend over there, Mohammed. When Mohammed is working his fields just 100 meters away, they both wave and shout at each other. Soon Shora wants to cross over to Iran for the first time in his life and visit him. After spending a lovely afternoon with Grand Bajora, it was way too late for hitchhiking back to Yerevan. Instead, we cycle back to Mehri, where we want to buy some food and look for a place for our tent. Tigran is taking us to Shvanizo, it's another village close to Mehri. And uh, we are going to visit uh, this uh, cultural house. We didn't have the hope that we would manage to do that today, but because we met him now, he's taking us there. Nardi Hara, Shashki Haran. It's poker, I have me to him, I'll hish him. Geradana, Gorazi, Joe, or the Galisain, Gurkindi came versinum, Danme, and Cartman, and me had a Geradani, Gurkiri, Yerekangam Cartatsu. They much got Geradana. Harash Yerevan is Hamer Gergaliste, Jorti Nurahas Nome, Tatron El Galis. Yes, I'm going to Lava, park us. You're going to have a chunny. I'm not some inch love girl. This is important.
Good night, Sink. Morning. So we're still we're still at the border to Iran and Megri. We stayed longer than expected because we kept on running into really nice people. Yeah, last night we stayed down there in this little hut. And now we are on the road and trying to find someone who will take us back towards Yerevan. Uh, in the meantime, we also changed our position. We are going this way. So instead of hitching before the town, we now hitch like behind it, which makes more sense. But it will be difficult because all the trucks we see come from Iran and they go pretty much empty in that direction and go full in the other direction. So it's hard to tell if we'll be successful. Bob, this. <laughs> Yes, Yerevan is him. Just when I was ready to give up. Love, love, love. Love. Just when I was ready to give up. And now it's amazing. And they're going to Yerevan. They're going to Yerevan. This is insane. So we got to get to Yerevan today. When I was thinking, oh, it might take like three, five days. To... The only sad thing is we will not see anything of the beautiful landscape. Yeah. But what can you do? It's like this. <laughs> We are already in Yerevan. We were shaken wildly. Arov had to throw up in the mountains and now she's sitting in the front, which helps a little bit. But we're almost there, which is amazing. So basically this concludes our Armenia. For the next couple of weeks we'll prepare for the ongoing adventure. We'll book some flights to Kazakhstan and skip Iran because of the situation there. And then we'll do the Silk Road continuation, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, and we'll see. Adobutun! <laughs> Almost there. They even brought us to our district. So we'll be home in, I guess, 20 minutes. Join us again when we take a bold and maybe also somewhat crazy gut decision, change our plans, enter an incredible world, and even become fairly poor multimillionaires. 18 million, 18 million. <laughs> we will release the next episode once this one reaches 500 likes. By now we sit on 4 terabytes of unedited raw footage and at the release of this episode you are actually one year behind. So why is that? Editing this type of unscripted and spontaneous documentaries takes us between one and two weeks per episode and we have already spent thousands of dollars and many months on it. A lot of that money went into accommodation and food. 
but there are also electronics we have to replace, like our drone which we crashed recently in Laos, our laptop that broke and our external hard drive which is about to fail. In the same time, one entire year of being monetized we barely made $400 with YouTube ads. At this rate we are not even sure if we can reach South Korea anymore, which was our minimal goal. We are trying to squeeze as much editing into each day, while spending as little as possible, but this is not going to cut it. So what can you do to help? This is crucial for small creators like us. Subscribe if you haven't already, activate all notifications, watch each episode to the very end and of course like, comment and share them. This will make our content visible to more people and therefore it might become sustainable at some point. In the meantime, you can also join our amazing contributors on buymeacoffee.com slash aworldbiketour. Through Buy Me A Coffee you can support our content creation by topping up our budget. And we can tell you with confidence, the best is yet to come. Anyhow, thanks for watching. Until next time. And may the wind be in your back.